Hi, this is Larry Elder, and this is the Larry Elder Show for Epic Times. Well, the President of the United States, Donald J. Trump, is in the UK enjoying a rare state dinner. Do you know there have only been three presidents who've been given a state dinner? They are George W. Bush, Barack Obama, and now Donald Trump. And where there's Donald Trump, there's bound to be Trump derangement syndrome on both sides of the pond. Check out what this pundit said about the state dinner at MSNBC. And I think Jonathan said something that's so key. It's like the mayor is Muslim and Meghan Markle is of African-American descent. And it's, it's, it's a perfect, awful storm for this Tragic. president. It really is. He plays out what he does here over abroad, over the pond, if you will. And he's just basically an embarrassment. Uh, all Americans should feel incredibly embarrassed by how this president represents us abroad. And it is all about his own interests. It's never about ours. And just think about it, the UK is basically a tinderbox right now, and he is the match. And then there's this headline from CNN. May I read it to you? Trump shatters diplomatic etiquette on eve of UK visit. And the article is all about how President Trump referred to the London mayor before he arrived in the UK as a stone cold loser and also dissed the newest member of the royal family, Meghan Markle, by calling her nasty. What it doesn't tell you is why President Trump made those comments. This piece is in the Huffington Post, not Breitbart, not Fox, not the Washington Examiner, not the Daily Caller, not the National Review, Huff Post. Here is the headline. London Mayor Sadiq Khan compares Donald Trump to fascists of the 20th century. Don't you think CNN should have put that in there when they made their article about Donald Trump's shattering etiquette? This is what people mean by fake news. How about telling us why Donald Trump called the London mayor a stone cold loser? He called him a stone cold loser because the London mayor said, among other things, Donald Trump is one of the quote, fascist of the 20th century, called it un-British to give him a state dinner, accused Donald Trump of xenophobia, racism, and otherness as an electoral tactic, deliberately lying repeatedly to the public, called him a growing global threat, and said that he's, quote, using the same divisive tropes of the fascists of the 20th century to garner support, but is also employing, quote, new sinister methods to deliver their message, close quote. So you're calling the president of the United States a fascist, except a neo-fascist, and you expect the president of the United States not to say something about him? Don't they know who this man is? This is Donald J. Trump. This is not George W. Bush, about whom the left repeatedly said, Bush lied, people died. You know, I interviewed Dick Cheney, and I interviewed Donald Rumsfeld, the former Secretary of Defense, and I asked them both, can you name me the number one regret that you have? They both said the same thing. They said when people were chanting, Bush lied, people died, we knew it was absurd, we knew it was ridiculous, we knew we relied in good faith on the intelligence, so we just assumed that the American people were not going to buy it. Boy, were we wrong. Donald Trump doesn't play that game. You call Donald Trump a fascist, you're going to get a response. You say that Donald Trump, were he to be elected, as Meghan Markle said, I'm moving to Canada. Well, Donald Trump's going to respond. And by the way, he didn't call her nasty. What he said was when he found out what she said about him, that she would move to Canada if he got elected, he said, and I quote, I didn't realize he was that nasty, end of quote. That's a whole different thing, don't you think? Even Christiane Amanpour, a not big fan of Trump over at CNN, even she said positive things about the visit. And the president gave a very, very good speech in response. Last thing about Trump and the UK. When referring to the London mayor as a stone cold loser, Donald Trump pointed out the fact, F-A-C-T, that non-homicide violent crime and property crime in London now exceeds the non-violent and property crime in New York City. And there is a growing problem of homelessness in London. They don't call it homelessness, they call it sleeping in the rough. And 12.4% of the London population is Muslim. Why is that a concern? Well, 4% support homicide bombing, 25% want some form of Sharia law, 50%, 5 believe that homosexuality should be illegal. Yeah, I think that's a bit of a problem, and I think so does Donald Trump. Now let's turn to the 2020 Democratic candidates, shall we? Do we have to? Yeah, we do. One of the candidates is the New York Senator Kirsten Gillenbrand. Here's what she said 
about abortion and men. Why should male legislatures across this country decide when you're having children, how many your children are having, and under what circumstances? I don't understand it. This whole men shouldn't be telling women what to do with their bodies on abortion issue has always puzzled me because when you look at the polls, the attitudes about abortion for men and women are about the same. The same percentage believe that abortion should be made illegal in all circumstances. The same percentage believe that abortion should be legal in all circumstances. And roughly the same percentage believe that abortion should be legal, but with restrictions. So there's virtually no difference between how men feel and women feel. What Gillenbrand is really saying is, men, you have no right to even have an opinion. What is that? Now on the impeachment front, you've got Democrats like Adam Schiff claiming that there were tons of evidence of collusion. Oops. The Mueller report comes out, no collusion, no conspiracy, no coordination, no interference with the probe, no assertion of executive privilege, and no additional indictments. Then Adam Schiff said, well, Trump has converted the Republican Party into a cult of personality. Here's the problem with that. Look at this graphic. Wow, 17% of Americans believe that Donald Trump is too liberal. What percentage of Americans thought George W. Bush was too liberal? 18%, a one point difference. 38% of the American people believe that Donald Trump's views are about right. What percentage of people believe that George W. Bush's views were about just right? 36%, two point difference. 39% of Americans believe that Donald Trump is too conservative Guess what percentage of Americans thought that George W. Bush was too conservative? 39%, the same. So if this is a cult of personality, how is it that the American people perceive ideologically Donald Trump and George W. Bush to be virtually identical, Mr. Schiff? Finally, Father's Day is coming up June 16. I wrote a book about my dad, it's called A Lot Like Me. It's about my eight hour conversation with my old man that I had when I was 25 years old after not speaking to him literally for almost 10 years. When I was 15 years old, I worked for my father. I didn't like working for my father. I thought my father was mean and harsh and abusive. I have two brothers. We all thought he was mean and harsh and abusive. And when I was 15 years old, he and I had a fight and we did not have a conversation for 15 years. Fast forward now, I'm a lawyer, I'm working in Cleveland, Ohio, even though I'm from Los Angeles, and I just passed the California bar, the Ohio bar, making big money, I should be living large, and I'm having difficulty sleeping. And I know it has something to do with my father. So I called my secretary, I said, cancel all my appointments, I'm gonna fly to LA, I'm gonna talk to my dad for a few minutes, and then I'll come right back. I flew out to LA, I figured my dad and I would have a 10 minute conversation. I walk into the restaurant, I had two big bags, my dad was surprised to see me, of course, and he said, Larry, should I put your bags in the back? I said, no, Dad, I'm only going to be here for five or ten minutes. I want to tell you something. I was going to tell him what a rotten dad I thought he was. I figured he'd respond by telling me what an unappreciative son I am. At least maybe I'd be able to sleep. So my dad and I sat on two stools no more than a foot or two apart, and we talked for eight hours. The first 20 minutes of it was me talking and telling my father all the bad things I thought he'd done to me, all the spankings, all the whippings, all the things he said or done to me that I thought were unfair and wrong. And when I was done, after the first 20 minutes, my father looked at me and he said, is that it? You didn't speak to me for 10 years because of that? Let me tell you about my father. Now let me pause here for a second. I knew my dad had no relatives because we never got any Christmas gifts. I knew he didn't have any, any siblings, and I met his mom one time. Aside from that, I knew nothing about my father's life and didn't really care, nor did my brothers. We, we thought he was so mean and harsh, and so I never really inquired. So we sat down, after I went off for 20 minutes, I saw my father cry for the first time in my life. I did not think the man could summon tears. He said, Larry, let me tell you about my father. You know your last name, Elder? I said, yeah. He said, Elder is not my biological father. I said, who's your biological father? He said, I have no idea. I never met him. I said, well, who was Elder? Elder was an alcoholic who was physically abusive to my mother and to me. When he would work, he would bring the money home to my mother because he would gamble it away. Come Wednesday, he'd want the money. She wouldn't give it to him. He'd beat her. I would jump in. He'd beat me. And he said his mother had a series of boyfriends, each one irresponsible. 
One day at the age of 13, Elder was long gone. My dad comes home from school, begins quarreling with his mom's then boyfriend. The mom sides with the boyfriend and throws my father out of the house, never to return. You're talking about a black boy in the Jim Crow South, Athens, Georgia, at the beginning of the Great Depression, dirt poor, he walks down the road, never returns home. My father then told me about the series of jobs he had, including becoming a Pullman porter on the trains. My father joined the Marines after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. I said, why the Marines, Dad? He said, two reasons. They go where the action is, and that's what I wanted, and I love those uniforms. My father said, he became a staff sergeant in the military, stationed on the island of Guam, was in charge of cooking for black soldiers. My dad could look at a cake, look at a pie, and tell you what's in it. So after the war is over, he goes to Chattanooga, Tennessee, where he met and married my mom, and went around town to get him a job as a short order cook. He was told by restaurant after restaurant, we don't hire inwards. My dad went to an unemployment office. The lady says, you went through the wrong door. There was a colored only door. My dad went through that door to the very same lady who sent him out. He came home that day to my mom and said, this is nonsense, I'm going to LA, I'm gonna get me a job. He'd come out to LA as a Pullman porter on the trains before World War II, and it was warm and sunny and people seemed less racist and more friendly. So my dad walked around for two and a half days and nobody would hire him. They said he had no references. He was treated the same way he was treated uh, in Tennessee. They were a little more polite about it. My dad calls the unemployment office, this time just one door. He takes the first job he can get, and that job was cleaning toilets at Nabisco brand bread, which he did for 10 years. Took a second job at another bread company cleaning toilets, cooked for a family on the weekend to make additional money, and went to night school two or three nights a week to get his GED. The man never slept. Maybe he averaged two, three hours a day. You average two or three hours a day, not week after week, not month after month, but year after year, and come home to a house with three rambunctious boys, and let's see how good you're feeling. The man never slept. That's why he was so cranky. The conversation took eight hours, and this book is about the eight-hour conversation my dad and I had. At the end of that, my dad got bigger and bigger and bigger. I got smaller and smaller and smaller, and now I'm crying. And I said to my father, I am so sorry I misjudged you. I'm so sorry I judged you so harshly. It was so unfair. And my father said, don't apologize. Just follow the advice I've always given you and your brothers. Hard work wins. You get out of life what you put into it. Larry, you cannot control the outcome, but you are 100% in control of the effort. And before you moan about what somebody did to you or said to you, go to the nearest mirror, look at it and say to yourself, what could I have done to change the outcome? And finally, no matter how hard you work, no matter how good you are, my dad said sooner or later, bad things will happen. How you respond to those bad things will tell your mother and me if we raised a man. So please check out my book, A Lot Like Me, perfect stocking stuffer for Father's Day, which is June 16th. This is Larry Elder, and this has been The Larry Elder Show for Epic Times. See you next time.